Yo. Is it cool if we have one of my friends join us for Austin? Yeah, that'd be great. Cool. Hey, John. Yeah, hi. Rick. We're just, uh, you know, you've had big classes before. I expect everybody will be here within uh, five minutes after class starts. <laughs> okay. Uh, so they're streaming in now. I'm setting it up so hopefully you can see most of them. Yeah, I see a whole bunch. Great. Do they see me? <laughs> yeah, they can. I'm going to switch to boom. There we go. Yeah. Uh, so I'll wait to do the full intro and everything. Um, and that'll be, a, that'll be a minute. How are you doing? Thanks for joining early. I know I, I was expecting you to not be available till like right at one. Oh, well, yeah, I got through, I got through some stuff. Um, um, I looked at my eyeballs and things, but um, little by little, you know, I have people sending me whole 800 page books. <laughs> 800 page books? Oh, some guy. Yeah. He sent, he sent me a hard copy, apparently, like a year ago. I don't recognize his name, and I never remember getting it. And it's about uh, Georgian iconography and concepts of Christianity and how they differ from more canonical Orthodox Christianity or, or Roman Catholic varieties. So it's a very arcane subject. And... Um, so he asked my opinion on it, you know, like a year later. And I said, please resend it. So he resent it electronically. But so um, you're supposed to give an opinion on an 800 page book? Something like that. I'll look at a bit of it, scan here and there. And then, well, there was some, some other guy that was an amateur linguist and he was dead set against Chomsky, which is fine with me. I am not particularly supportive of Chomsky. Right. Yeah. So I've he was saying you. that, you know, I can't be right and he can't be right. We, one or the other, blah, blah. And basically what he was saying is that all meaning was expressible by words and that the sentences were a red herring. You shouldn't worry about syntax. So I simply sent, sent back, and this was something I had gone through a, a colleague of mine, a anthropo retired anthropologist, Chris Hallpike, who's quite highly regarded and he's quite good. And I just wrote back and I said, look, I said, every language in every language imaginable, you can make a dictionary. And what you do with the dictionary is you have a word on one side and you have a whole bunch of sentences on the other describing what the word means. And so, so there's this mysterious equivalence between sort of the cognitive, the neutral cognitive you know, the concept and its manifestation either as a word or as a bunch of sentences. And I said, you know, clearly you can say more with sentences than you can with a single word, but the equivalence is still there. And I said, so your position is untenable. <laughs> That's ridiculous. So that was something I went through. I had to deal with back in July, I think, something maybe early August. I don't know. And the biggest, the biggest, biggest panic for the last two weeks was that my printer, after ten years, finally died. And oh, you did that, yeah. <laughs> I had to get a new one, and I got a Hewlett Packard on the recommendation of my eldest son, who has a, a Macintosh and a Hewlett Packard. And for a complicated machine, it has the worst instructions anything I've ever seen. Um, 
So I figured out how to scan documents. And I think I figured out how to copy them. So it's got this thing on top as a scanner and a copier. And I can print off documents, but I can't print. They always come out printed on both sides. And there's a little thing on the, on the screen that says you can do this one to one or one to two or two to one or so. I so I, I thought I'd do one to one, but it's not working. So, and then we have to do it, or I want, I'm going to try to do it so that my wife can pick up, pick it up on her iPad, which means that Linda has to, I think, go and download some stuff from Hewlett Packard. But we'll see. But what a pain in the ass. What a pain in the ass. It weighs about 50 pounds. <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, yeah, you yeah. know, I haven't even owned a printer in forever. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just, you know, I haven't, I now do so much uh, just digitally. I hardly ever even print anything out. You know what's a big deal for me, though, is I have an iPad with a pen, and it's so good. So I can, like, most of the stuff I would do on paper, I have a thin little bitty iPad that I write on with a pen. And hmm. I've tried to do that for three different generations of technology, and none of them have really been ready. Mm -hmm. Until finally, this new one is really not bad. It's really, okay. really pretty good. What, what brand is it? It's Apple. Apple, okay. Yeah. And my wife has an Apple iPad, and she she's on it all the time, and she can find all kinds of stuff. And is it a new one? the The new ones in the last couple of years are kind of a different deal. This one's about a year old. Yeah. About a year old. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I'm looking around. It's going to get too loud for me to hear you till I quiet them all down in the next couple of minutes. Um, I'm looking for, I'm trying to fix my audio settings so I can send it out of the speaker I intend to be spend, sending this sound out of. Okay. Um, why is this not? Does anybody know how to pick which audio output device you want to use on an iPad? Like, oh, is it in the Zoom settings? Okay, okay. Are the settings in Zoom or are they? Oh, wait, meeting settings. Um, wait. There should be a dash on my microphone. I don't see a dash. It could be because this is an iPad and they uh, try to simplify things on the iPad, which is kind of obnoxious. But to settings, back to settings. <laughs> In the actual Zoom settings, where is that? Press the back arrow, the top left back arrow. Is it blue? There we go. Uh, general. General. Wait, let me just look this up. Sure. Yeah, that's great. No, it's just, I just wanted to come out of my iPad instead of sending it to the HDMI cord. Because I'm pretty sure that my iPad's louder and clearer than this. Wow, we are packed. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. I've gone through all my settings. Hmm. Well, let's see if we can make it work. Oh, you got it? In in what? In my... Uh... Okay. And then audio and visual. Where's that? There we go. Is it one of these? It says, adjust any of the following mono audio turn on to combine the left and right channels. Send on. Oh, wait. Now it says control center. Control center. Okay. And then touch and hold the audio card in the upper right corner of the control center. Do you see that? What is happening? Isn't that crazy? All the instructions online are like never updated. This is a video. This is a video. Oh. 
Okay, okay. Can you can you hear me, John? Yeah, I hear you. Fine. Yeah. Can you okay. hear me? Yes. Okay. We I there we go. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna just set you up with the I'm gonna try and get us a mm, now it's being a little slow on me. Hold on a second. I've done something to it. How am I logged in three times? There we are. Okay. There we go. Okay, let me just try and get us. All right. So you guys all in the back. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be on zero computers today. Computers going to be entirely off, everybody. We're not going to do a quiz as we go. No quiz on today's unit. So no computers. Uh, and everybody try to find your way to be seen on this camera. I'll, I'll back it up, but it's also our audio. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. That's what we're doing. Okay. Um, I can get... So there's no quiz? No quiz. But that's also why there's no computers. So we can all be super zoom focused today. All right, how much can I get you guys? Okay, I have one, two, three, four, five seats. So five people. Let's see if we can get you guys in here. This one's taken. Those of you in the most back, those of you in the most back, please come on in. All right, guys. I need focus. <clears throat> We're just getting ourselves started here. <clears throat> Thank you guys for moving. Um, everybody do try to make yourself visible, especially because I want you to be able to ask questions and I want uh, John to be able to see you when he asks a question. I guess I can kind of like walk around, I guess, and kind of kind of make it visible. I don't mind doing that. I feel like sorry. All right, John, just so you can have a full scan of the room before we actually get to less of them than I can fit on the screen. I wonder. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, everybody's found a seat. Ready? Let's get started. All right, cool. So everybody, please turn off your computers. We don't need computers today. Uh, we do not need, um, we're not going to do a quiz on this unit. No quiz on this unit. Cool. Um, so if you guys remember from last time where we left off, we did the Bronze Age collapse. We started with Schliemann, talked about how he found Troy talked about some archaeological implications where we learned that uh, the, his jumpstart of archaeology was very rough and brutish, and we started shifting from dynamite to paintbrushes over time, right? So we shifted our conversation from Schliemann and Troy into a conversation about Troy. We learned the story of Troy. Then we went into the history of what was going on around this story, this larger Bronze Age collapse. Well, one of the things we landed on at the end is that there are some real critical differences between the world before and the world after this Bronze Age collapse. Does anybody remember any of the key differences? Like just definitive, completely different world. Sea people, they're the one, they're the invaders. They did the thing. They did the dislodging. Yeah. Iron. Iron, yes. This is the birth of the iron, uh, a world made of iron. There was some iron a little bit before this, but now we have iron everywhere pervasively. Uh, anybody remember the other big thing? Meteorites. Yep, we're I'm glad we remember the meteorites. We talked about that. Yeah. I forget the name, but the the billows. Yes, the technological breakthrough. The billows that enabled the iron. Excellent in the furnace too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all the old civilizations could not like last in the new um, iron age. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I want to make sure John can hear everybody. So. 
normally I try to be really like, you know, bend but don't break with the whole like talking between each other during class. But if you do it, this is this is hard. We're talking to a guy on Zoom from Canada, so we, we can't do it. So I really need to ask you guys to be all in on, on this. Yes, my fellow Canary, our uh, local Canadian. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what was that? Yes, the phonetic alphabet starts to spread big time. Yeah. And what was the other big language shift that happens over a long period of time? Or you want to add something first? Slave uprising. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That was big time. Now, unfortunately, it wasn't the end of slavery, but that was the disruption. So what was the other big language shift? We have the phonetic alphabet, and I threw this on right at the very end and said, if you actually zoom out into like a larger, like four, five, six hundred year period, there's a big language shift. Does anybody remember what that was? Yeah. Literacy. literacy. Well, literacy, because of the phonetic alphabet, now all of a sudden a lot more people can read. Reading literacy goes down from being a hyper elite thing to being a, uh, not to say it wasn't elite all throughout the world and all over the place, but it becomes accessible by anybody that really wants to try. Um, the other big thing, what languages were they speaking in these former civilizations? Yeah. I, I remember you saying at the end of our last lecture that it was mainly Eurasian. Now we're there you are. Yeah. yeah. The Indo-Europeans. So what happens is, is we go from a time where the Egyptians are in the Nile, the Harappans are in the um, Indu River Valley, the Tigris Euphrates is run by uh, Semites, right? Does anybody, by the way, Semites, this is an interesting thing, it's going to be relevant to language families and genetic families, right? Semitic, to be Semitic, does anybody know where, where that name comes from? Yeah. That's right, anti-Semitic. So who do people hate? They hate Jews, that's anti-Semitism. How, uh, Semitism. However, Semites include um, not all Muslims, but some Muslims. Persians are not Semites. They're actually Indo-Europeans and they're Muslims and there's lots of Muslims everywhere. But a lot of what you think of as Middle Eastern Muslims are Semitic. They see themselves as descendants of uh, Shem. So they have this uh, common mythological history with Jews and this common language, the uh, Semitic languages. So the Semitic languages are huge in the Middle East. Yeah. Um, how, how, then if, if they're not like, if Semitic doesn't mean Jewish, where does anti-Semitic come from? That's a good question because I think that the anti, uh, it's a good question. Actually, John, <laughs> first question of the day. <laughs> okay. Uh, hold, let's hold that question for the first question. Let me introduce John and wrap up this, this piece. So uh, the, the final piece here is that you're going to displace all these old language families and replace them with, you want to tell us? Well, I was going to ask if there's a way that we can like, see in. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. There we are. Yeah. 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 Um, so they're all replaced over time with Indo-European language driven civilizations. The Greeks, the Romans, the Celts, the Norse, uh, the Persians, all these civilizations on the rise are Indo-European speaking. So we're here with John today for two and a half, make it 10 reasons. So the, the two key reasons are we're doing the fourth and final field of anthropology today, right? Not there are endless subfields, but there are these four major fields, right? So let's recap. Those are um, archaeology, biology, cultural. cultural, and linguistics. So today we're on linguistics, and John is an incredible linguist, a world-leading linguist. He started the world's largest linguistics department in Canada. So we're lucky to have him to talk about linguistics. <laughs> the other reason why he's here is because uh, we're going to continue the story that we landed on last time with the fall of the Bronze Age civilization. This is setting up the rise of these Indo-European civilizations. And John is believed by many to be some, some of the very, very best in the world believe John is the world's leading Indo-European scholar. He's in that conversation. We're very lucky to have him here with us. So we're gonna be talking about linguistics and Indo-European uh, and the Indo-Europeans. Now, the other reason he's here is because he's a friend and an amazing teacher, and I'm really grateful that he's going to join us for this adventure and for this class. Um, so thanks, John, for, for joining us. Thank you, John. <laughs> uh, thanks for all the praise, Will. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe you can give a call to my dean and do the same thing again. 
Uh, <laughs> well, um, I'm, you seem to be having an interesting course, uh, and I'm going to sort of add some chunk to it that is perhaps not in a direct line to what you're already doing, but perhaps in a side in some way. But um, uh, what I'm going to do is basically set what you've been doing in a kind of larger context of sorts. The first, I'm going to start out with something that seems totally unrelated. Uh, this is something that I have as part of my linguistic training. Um, and that is that uh, how does a child pick up a language? And children do it. Uh, they do it very quickly. Uh, they do it without accent because, <laughs> because um, it's their first language that they're picking up. And we know from studies of child language acquisition that they are guessing at what their parents are saying they are trying to figure out what sorts of choices they have to make in terms of grammar to somehow approximate what the parents are doing. They never quite get it right. And the process of parent supervising child or talking and, and interacting with a child, not training it, they just automatically begin to pick up language. The, that process has a tolerance, what I call a tolerance metric in it. In other words, the parent will say, that, that's good, that's okay, yeah, and uh, accept it or not react in any adverse way at all, but not notice perhaps that the child has not quite pronounced the, the sound properly, had not quite gotten the grammar right, and so forth. Uh, as an example, my daughter, when she was a little, uh, said to my wife, and I was eating dinner, I was the last one to finish my plate, she said, daddy is eating at dinner. And I was astounded because that's something you find in certain languages, such as the Georgian language from the South Caucasus um, or Circassian language from the North Caucasus or from Turkey, where most of them now live, um, but not in English. But that was, a good, that was a good try. It was not bad. It was something that would have passed just fine and dandy. I noticed it because <laughs> I, I knew Circassian, I knew Georgian. Um, and I rec recognize it as, as a, what they call an incomplete transitive or a continuous um, um, unfulfilled transitive. Um, but my wife didn't notice it at all. Uh, so I kept wondering, will she say it again and come up with some kind of new construction for English? Uh, she never did. <laughs> she just kept going on and would say things like, daddy is not finished yet and things like that. Okay. Now, the point here is that because children can have to guess and the parents don't really have access to the structure and the grammar of their language, they don't have that kind of knowledge to actually say to the child, look, you have to put case in the, on the pronoun. You can't just say that, you know, blah, blah. They can't do that. It's entirely done by, by guesswork. There's going to be noise in the process between generations, and that commits the acquisition of language to a certain process. It means that language is never stable. It is going to change through time, and there's not a damn thing that anyone can do to stop that. Okay, so that immediately arises from this theoretical issue of how a child picks up language. So any language at any given time represents only a slice of that language at that time. And in fact, if you're a sociolinguist, you go around talking to people, uh, you know, from some different neighborhood or maybe the next town over and that kind of stuff. And you'll find tiny little differences even there. So it's not even uniform in a given time for that matter. Now, I'm, in, I'm in the west end of Lake Ontario and I was driving through New York State on my way back to, well, I grew up in New Jersey um, to see my father. And I stopped at a mall and the lady, I bought something and my, the lady said, do you want a boss? I said, what? A boss? She said, maybe, oh, she said, oh, I'm not a bosses. And she turned to the next clerk over. Can you give me some bosses? And then I realized she was talking about boxes. Okay. And that's the only place anywhere I'd ever heard that. That K is lost in front of an S in that particular small little area right there. Okay. And of course, you get things like the Southern Drawl as well. And you get things that are very prominent. And if you go to Europe, for example, I studied German and my first job was in Vienna. I went to Europe, no one speaks German, not the way it is in the textbook. Oh no, <laughs> they speak this and that and the other. And in fact, the thing in the textbook is a kind of fantasy that some professor somewhere has imagined. 
okay, and puts it out like this. So language change and language variability is inescapable. All right, so now let's switch gears and go to actually looking at Indo-European and how one starts out doing it. Um, it was a, a man named William Jones in 1776, if I remember correctly, the same year as American independence. Um, he was the Viceroy of India and he gave a talk at the Royal Oriental Society. It was an interesting talk because he was an interesting fellow uh, compared to modern politicians, for example. He had studied Greek, he had studied Latin, and while in India, he had decided he would study Sanskrit, which is the old language, sort of like the Latin of India. Okay. And he was amazed because he said there were these parallels, these things that look almost alike between these three languages. And he said, well, you know, we always assumed that Latin and Greek were just sort of alike because they're part of the same civilization. But you can't say that about India. It's way off to the east, quite a different place. And yet the languages look almost exactly alike. So maybe, maybe they descend from a common mother tongue that may not be spoken anywhere anymore. It's not. <laughs> and has given rise to these three languages. That got the ball of Indo-European studies rolling. Oddly enough, it was 1815 or so, and some actual tangible work began to appear. It's almost 40 years later, like another generation or so. Okay. And now what do they do? What do you do to reconstruct a language that has been dead for thousands of years? Uh, can you do this? Well, you go to the surviving pieces of it and you start comparing them. So let me actually do that for you. Now let's take English, the word foot. Now what you have to do, you have to have kind of a weird mindset. You have to sort of look at words as objects. They're sort of family heirlooms that have been passed down by generation to generation. Okay, and if you sort of have that mindset, in fact, it looks as though these things really are objects and you can fiddle with them and adjust them and play with them. Okay, that's the key to being able to do this kind of topic, that and perhaps knowing, you know, five or six languages. Um, although you don't have, you can sort of squeeze around that one, but most of these guys know up to 20 or more. They're what they're called hyper polyglots. Um, but anyway, so let's look at the word foot. F-O-O-T. Now look at the way it's spelled, the spell with two O's. That suggests a long foot, not foot, but foot. And often what we do, particularly with English, which is which is spe spelling is a mess, is we look back at the spelling and try to get information out of it that way. Okay. So what's the word for foot in Latin? P long E S, pes. But if you go to the possessive form, that they call it, has a case called a genitive on the end of it, is, you get pedis, and there's a D. Oh, okay. Go to Greek. What's the word for foot in Greek? Pos, P long O S. Oh, same thing. Go to the possessive form, podos. You get your D again. Okay. And let's go to Sanskrit footprint, not foot, but footprint, padam, P A D A M. Okay. So what do you have here? You have what we call sound correspondence. You build up a bunch of these. This is sort of like being a lawyer and taking it to court. Although <laughs> uh, I wouldn't want to go to court in the circumstances that are now prevailing in the political world down in the US. But F in, F in English, P in Latin, P in Greek, P in Sanskrit. T in English, D in Latin, D in Greek, D in Sanskrit. These are called sound correspondences, and you get maybe four or five good ones, or maybe a couple of dozen, depends. And what does it mean? It means somehow, if you look at these three languages over here with their P's, and want to find something else that resembles them in some way in English, look for something that starts in an F, has some kind of vowel, and then has a T. Because all the, all the others have P, some kind of vowel, and then a D. And if you can find these kinds of matches like this, we say you're looking at cognates, ones that are of common origin is what it means. These are words that have been passed down by hundreds of generations through thousands of years from an original that has given rise to the attested form, we say the ones you can actually find, okay? Now, so you have this, you know, you have this sound correspondence. You have two sound correspondences in the examples I gave you. You have F in English, P everywhere else. 
T in English, D everywhere else. Okay. Now, what do you have to do? You have to decide what the original looked like. This gets tricky. Sometimes it's not possible. You have to resort to sort of abstract representations. But in this case, no. We're going to assume that the original started with a P. Why? Well, if you so, if you go to something called phonology and phonetics, and you're actually examining what is being said now with current people, and, and not any regard for history at all, you say it's much easier to get an F from a P than it is to get a P from an F. Getting a P from an F is called hardening. Getting an F from a P is a very common process and across a whole range of languages on a planet. It's called softening, okay? So we figure that, yeah, the original must have had a P and it must then have had a D and it had some kind of a vowel. So the original word for foot was something like pod or ped, that kind of thing. Okay. Notice that apart from the Sanskrit word for footprint, they all match up quite well in their meaning. So let's take another one, just to give you an example. Feather in English, F again. So what do you expect in the other languages? Well, Latin doesn't have a cognate for this, but Greek does. <laughs> Pterodactyl or pteron, P-T-E-R-O-N. And it's got this R-O-N, you know, like feather has an R, there's an R and an O-N as well, <laughs> okay? But the R is also there. And then what do we do with Sanskrit? Well, we have pata, which means to fly in Sanskrit. So again, you have F and P's, and in this case you have mm -hmm. and T's, and you have R's and R's, okay? And in one case, there's no vowel, it's P-T and then E-R, but in English it's F-E-A, something, blah, blah. So the match is a little more complex. Something has happened to the vowel, Latin's lost it all together, Sanskrit's lost the R, and the meanings are not quite the same. Feather, wing, fly, obviously some kind of words or family of words that had to do with birds and flying about and that kind of thing and their feathers. But that still will pass muster. Generally, a, a cognate set like that is acceptable because it's clear that the semantics, we call it the meaning, has been distorted in some ways, but it's still sort of in the same ballpark. It's not totally, totally crazy. I mean, you can get other things that just, you know, just off the wall. All right. But those cognate sets are not cognate sets, they're rejected. So you have these sound correspondences, you start building these up. And supposedly, with any luck, you have a, like a whole bunch of old dictionaries and you know how they look and read the alphabets and so forth. And you go through these and plow, for, plow through stuff. And it seems a you know, intensely boring, but then you find these cognates that keep popping up. Absolutely, absolutely nuts, nuts, okay? <laughs> Crazy. All right, so that's, that's the beginning, that's the start. And then what do you do? Well, I told you, you decide what the original looked like. It's sort of hard looking at the words for feather and flight and wing and all that. A little hard to figure it out. You have to let the vowel be there and maybe it goes away and whatnot. And it's going to turn out, in fact, that whether there's a vowel and whether it stays or not is part of the grammar of the original language. So it's not just a distortion of Greek. It's actually an inheritance of what we call a different grade of the word. Vowel grade of the word. Okay. But once you have these hypothetical originals and you always mark them with an asterisk, that's how you know, oh, this is a concocted form. This is a reconstructed form, we call it. You have what we then call sound laws. And what does that mean? This is where it gets interesting because a sound law defines a community that has descended from the original mother community. So it's a daughter community. All the terminology is, is fem, feminine here. It's a daughter community, and it is defined by a set of what we call sound shifts or sound laws, where we're going from an original down to some kind of a tested form, a real form. So if we're looking at an original that we suspect began with P, and we want to find something in English, we find something beginning with an F. And where else do you find that? You find it in German. You find it in Danish, you find it in Swedish and Norwegian and Faroese and Icelandic, okay? And the extinct language called Gothic, which is known from a Bible, partial translation of a Bible. And these define 
a kind of daughter, an early daughter that no longer existed by the time of historical attestation. And what daughter would that have been with the F from the P to the F? That would be what we call Germanic. So we assume at some point there was a mother community. And after a thousand years or, or so, they began to drift apart. In fact, they, they drifted apart because they invented nomadism, as far as we can tell. No one else before them. These are the first people that began to wander all out around the prairies of Central Asia. Where they're called steppes for some reason, S-T-E-P-P-E-S, -P -P -E the steppes of Central Asia. And that was about probably 5,000 years ago. And at some point, some of them wandered up into what's now Scandinavia, Denmark, and they spoke a daughter community that we call Proto-Germanic. So Proto-Indo-European, now Proto-Germanic. Another group went down east into the prairies and then down south. And where, what do we call those? We call those Indo-Iranians, <laughs> okay? Some of them went into India and gave rise to Sanskrit and others went into what is now Iran and gave rise to ancient Persian and some other stuff as well. Okay. So suddenly we're at the stage where we can actually make claims and justify those claims about the existence of ancient communities that have descended from an original community. And we can define how their words will actually look in some way. Okay. Now, how far can we push that stuff with all the fancy words? Well, let me give you another set. Okay. I'll give you two more sets to make two more points. Now, suppose we go to kinship terms. All right. And you're going to see that, that the, shared, the shared vocabulary, the cognates, always involve fairly common uh, families of words, like kinship words, clothing, common food, common animals, uh, some activities like milking a cow, and uh, that kind of thing. Okay, The word for wheel, uh, word for chariot, and, and uh, this sort of thing, the word for certain kinds of plants. You know. um, so let's go and let's look at the kinship terms. What's the word father in English? Ah, it's got an F. So what do you expect to find in the other, our other three languages, Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit? You expect to find a P, right? And what do you get in Latin? You get pater. And what do you get in Greek? You get pater. <laughs> and what do you get in Sanskrit? You get pitar or pita, okay? An I, the other ones have A's. It's weird. And how about daughter? You get uh, English daughter, and you get Latin. Um, I can't remember the Latin. Uh, the Greek is thugater, and um, the Sanskrit is duhita. Okay, R's dropped off again, uh, but we've seen that before. <laughs> okay, um, and if we look at these, they have an author, uh, author ending in each case. At least the word for father is built on a form with a p. The word for mother is built on a form with a ma. Okay. And it turns out that the vast majority of languages on earth have words for father that are like pa or papa, and words for mother like ma or mama. Okay. There are some different, different ones, atiet, Russian atiets, ato, uh, atala, little father, things like that. But the p's and the m's you know, really dominate by maybe 75, 80%. Okay. There are two languages on earth in which mama means father, Georgian and a language from Australia, but we'll ignore that, <laughs> okay? So if we pry off these basic kinship terms like the P and the M, we're left with author. Is there something we can do with that piece? Yeah, there is. If you change the R to an L, and there are a bunch of words that do that, that's another process you documented by correspondence sets. If you take the R and make it an L, you got Othil. How about the TV show, The Last Kingdom? Athelstan, Athel this, Athel so and so. And it means noble. Athelstan is a jewel. Athelstan. So, what the kinship terms are, they're made out of two pieces. They're made out of the basic term plus the word honorable or noble, however you want to give a meaning for that. It's, it's obvious that the meaning is something like that, but, but not exactly which one. Okay, so noble father, noble mother, noble daughter. 
and brother too, Barathe, noble, noble brother. Um, Baradar in Persian, Baradar. Uh, so you can see that right there, it's Indo-European. Okay, it, don't confuse the, the, the alphabet with the actual language. <laughs> right, so you see you have uh, Islamic alphabet for Persian, but don't confuse, you, you get used to that, you learn to read that, and on you go with Persian. Okay, I had to study Farsi, uh, Persian um, when I started grad school. Um, so that's another story for another lecture like that. So sometimes we're actually able to pry things apart and talk about the grammar of the words. And if you look at some of the ancient tales, like the Iliad about Troy, well, sometimes we're able even to pick out ancient sentence patterns as well for similar reasons, although it's been much harder to do that because syntax is much more flexible. Okay. And now let me give you another example that makes another point. Let's look at English two, T-W-O. Notice that it's spelled with a W that no one says, unless you say twice. Oh, there's the W. Or twilight, twi meant half, half light, twilight. Okay. So, whoa, I actually had a W at one point. That's why it's still written with a W. It was originally pronounced two. Well, let's go to Latin. And you had your T D, so we expect a D. And you get the wall, Greek the wall, Sanskrit the va. Okay. Oh, all right. That's expected. You get T in Germanic, you get D in the others. You should get a W in Germanic, the others have a W or a V or something like that, and the vowels and so forth. Okay. Let's go to another language. Let's go to Armenian. Anyone here speak Armenian? Hayek? Nobody? Hayek? <laughs> okay. Uh, that means, are you Armenian? Um, they call themselves high, not Armenian. Um, what's the word for two in Armenian? Yerku. What? Yerku. <laughs> but you know, it's not. It's it's not that Armenian is there just just as Armenian, no matter what. Having come from Indo-European, it's that Armenian has its own history, and there are about eight different sound changes that have afflicted the word dual to produce yerku. The wo becomes a wo, becomes a g, becomes a k, because of the d becoming a t, and then it becomes an r and a k, and then the wo becomes an u, and then there's an e on the front, and blah, 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 like that. And there are three other words, word for educating, and some others that also have this dua yerk correspondence. So you can get these crazy looking correspondences. And you sit back and wonder, how in the world did they ever end up talking this way? Starting out with dual, and you end up talking yerku. How do they do this? You know, so you make up this. You know, look around for other languages, other changes, other stages, and you say, well, you know, there's a lengthy history here of Armenian, and it must be uh, that it's evolved on its own for uh, several thousand years. Okay. And you know, well, where are they? They were sort of isolated in the highlands of eastern Turkey, southern Caucasus. Okay, so they were sort of you know parked away somewhere. And actually, they, they bear an ethnonym that is non Indo European. Why? Because certain areas seem to have resisted Indo European expansion. And one of the most prominent ones was the Caucasus, where there are 50 languages spoken in an area the size of Spain. And there are three distinct language families. Well, what do you mean, language families? <laughs> okay. Well, I was just doing for Indo European. You can do for native languages here. Um, you can do for some of the things in the Caucasus. So you look at Georgian, and what else do you find? There's some of the languages along the, the coast called Mangrelian and Laz. Look at one up in the hills, it's called Sfan. Okay. Now you go up on the other side of the hills, or just along the Black Sea coast, there's Abkhazian and Circassian, and that's another family. And then you go east, and they're the Chechens, and up in the hills are their cousins. And that's another family. <laughs> and you go into Europe, further into Europe, go to the Pyrenees, what do you get? You get another language that is non-Indo-European, it's Basque. Okay. And one of the things I'm known for is having reconstructed the original language for Circassian and Abkhazian. It's called Proto-Northwest Caucasian because the family is called Northwest Caucasian. Very difficult to do, very bizarre. These languages have up to 80 consonants. Um, they only have two vowels. Uh, it's very, very weird. 
But once I had done that, there was an Indo-Europeanist, he's dead now, he lived to be 98, called Eric Hamp at the University of Chicago. So I gave this talk about Proto-Northwest Caucasian at a conference on Caucasian languages that met every two years at Chicago. Hamp, Eric Hamp, he was a tiny man, grabbed me and dragged me out. And we sat in a cold April um, uh, afternoon out in a courtyard. And he said, you should look at Indo-European because I think this language family is related to Indo-European. I tried for two years to, to prove it right or wrong until the last month. And I said to my wife, I have to go to Chicago and announce I've done nothing, I've gotten nowhere. And then there was a word for fire. Huh. Okay, why the word for fire? Well, in Circassian and Ubuch, that's between the two, you could use transitional uh, languages. Um, the word for fire was pahur. Pa means to fall down and set fire, referring to sacred fire in, ignited by a lightning bolt. Hua was to fall down, and ur meant the one that did this, made a noun out of the, out of the two verbs or a preposition or a verb, pahur. What was the Indo-European word for fire, sacred fire? Pahur. What's the cognate? P, F in English, fire. <laughs> Pyro in Greek, a pyromaniac, things like that, okay? And in fact, once I, I saw that correspondence set, all these, about 80 correspondence sets began to fall out. And that's enough to make what we call a very tenuous connection. Now, we talk about mother language, if we compare two mother languages, the way we do their existing daughters, we can do that too. There's nothing to stop us from playing that game. And what do we get? We get a grandmother, okay? We don't call that a grandmother. We call it a phyletic predecessor, using a term from biology for a phylum, which is like a vertebrates form of phylum, uh, insects form of phylum, things like arachnids, rather, little things with little jointed legs. Um, so this, this is a phyletic, or a long range comparison on a phyletic ancestor. And there's some efforts to try to do that elsewhere. So in terms of time, probably the original was in the Caucasus somewhere. And then along comes a geneticist. So I was at a conference in 2010 at Harvard and this geneticist came down about genetics and Eurasia and languages and all that. And he knew that I worked on the Caucasus. So he comes up to me and he says, look, he said, we have this gene and it's found in men on the Y chromosome, but only if they speak an Indo-European language in Northern India, okay? And then we find it scattered here and there and whatnot, but the people who have the most of this gene are people here on the map called the Dige. Now, who the heck are these Dige? Someone told me, you know who these are. I said, yeah, these are Circassians. You just proved my point that they share genetically and linguistically an origin with the Indo-Europeans as well. <laughs> and they're called a dihi, a dihi, like that. The D is from an R, the A is an article stuck on, the original is rihe, and if you throw it all together, it's aryon in Indo-European, and it just simply means people. And what did the Indo-Europeans call themselves? Aryons. Not Aryans and Hitler, not crazy shit, but Aryons. Okay. So we even know what they call themselves. And we even know what their cousins call themselves. And they still call themselves that, but they screwed up the R, made it a D. But they kept the G, which in the European did as a Y. The G is, is characteristic of Circassians. G and R and W and R and all kinds of crazy sounds. Okay. So we're back probably to the late Neolithic, early Bronze Age. They begin their expansion. They come down and spread out into India and into Iran, and they uh, come into the Middle East a little bit. And I can give you an example from the Middle East. There's a kingdom of the Mitanni. This is a Bronze Age culture. It was up in Northern Mesopotamia, and we have some clay tablets with, with writing on it. And they're in, they're about how to train a horse. And they're written in what seems to be an ancient form of Sanskrit. Why? Because it says Eka Vartana. Eka is one turn of the chariot, Vartana. Um, and the, the K is characteristic of, of one, the numeral one in uh, Indo-Aryan, uh, Indo the, the language for Sanskrit and, and, and whatnot, all the 
modern languages of India, except for the South, Tamil and all that. Um, and if you look at Iranian, it's Aya, it would be Aya of our time. So instead of a K, it's a Y. And if you go West and you start getting uh, uh, an N instead of either the Y or K. So some kind of suffix going on on the numeral one, it's not a simple word. That's a bit of a surprise. A word basically like that should be a simple word, but it's not an Indo-European. It's not, very strange. So they have words for wheel and, and, and words for chariot. The word for wheel is quick, wheel. And this is the same as Old English wheel, wheel today, to this day. And um, it's spelled W-H. And I speak a form of English where the W-H is hua. It's still preserved. Wine and wine sound like different words for me. But I'm sure all of you in the audience, none of you in the audience have W-H. You all have W. Why? Because your parents tolerated it and let it slip by. Okay, so that's a living example. <laughs> but this is a nice clean piece is emerging. This is major advances in our understanding of the prehistory of these people. Um, and uh, there, there are some problems involved. There is a group in, in what's now Turkey called Hittites. They have no word for wheel. Okay. And their grammar, they're clearly related to Indo-European, but their grammar is not quite the same in certain crucial ways. We're still trying to work out exactly what's going on here. We're thinking that there was an even an early stage of Indo-European and then a middle stage and then a late stage. And that this Hittite stuff came off at a very early stage. That's what we think, but it still is, doesn't, it's not clear what it explains. Okay. Now, you can, as I said, you can do this for other languages. And one of the big families they've done this for is Semitic, okay, which is Assyrian and um, uh, Akkadian and Elamite and not Elamite, excuse me, Ebla, Eblaite. Um, uh, and then there are languages that seem to be orphans. Now, in the Middle East, the orphan language is Sumerian. The grammar is completely different from anything in uh, Semitic. It looks more like something from the Caucasus, maybe, uh, but none of the words match up. It's not possible. There are any kind of sound correspondences, anything like that. It's weird. It seems to be what we call a language isolate. The most we can do is sort of look at old fashioned, old forms that don't, are no longer productive and take it back to an older stage based on what we call uh, archaic retentions of some sort. If we can do that, it's called internal reconstruction. It's tricky. But we can sort of do it a little bit with Sumerian, but still we don't get much of anywhere with that. Okay. The other thing you can do is um, try to, if, if you're lucky, is make a scansion of all kinds of stuff across the world and see if you can locate a language that might, might be uh, a relative of some sort. Now in North America, what's happened with that is there's a whole bunch of languages that are across sort of southern Canada, down in the northeastern U.S., they're called Argonkian. And we get Cree, and we get Massachusetts, and we get uh, Powhatan for um, um, uh, the, um, <laughs> the little lady from Walt Disney, uh, Pocahontas. Okay, <laughs> Pocahontas is speaking an Algonquian language. The name is Algonquian name. And we go all the way out to uh, the prairies, and we find really weird sound corresponses, but they're regular. So we find one language has W, the other language has Ch. <laughs> so it's sort of like an Armenian-like situation again. But then we find two little languages in Northern California, we ought and Yurok. And it turns out that they are both related to Algonquian, but neither one is either is particularly close to each, to each other. And completely separated by all, over a thousand miles from the rest of Algonquian. What's going on? Well, now we have time to talk geography. Apparently they were coming in the land bridge from Asia and they came in and some of them went south into California. The rest of them continued on eastward and gave the rest of the family. Okay. So we can actually do sort of history of movements and things like that, which are you know pretty good. And most recently there is a language family in on the Yenisei River in Siberia that is thought to be related to some of the native languages uh, mm -hmm. in North America. Now, finally, I wanna make a point. It's quite possible to find words that look alike or look similar, 
in languages and it's purely by accident all right so um bad in english and iranian farsi is bad and it means the same thing it means bad <laughs> but it turns out that it's just purely a coincidence the uh, the two languages uh, two words have completely different histories and the two different branches of indo-european okay and if you go to hawaii and it's very easy to find uh, like a dozen words or so a like helios and the words like this crazy words that are repeated in Hawaiian, but are purely, purely by accident. Okay. So you have to be careful. This is why it's important to build a whole set sometimes and to rule out chance similarities as such. But it's an, more, it's an enormously powerful technique. It's called a comparative method. And it's as close to a time machine as we're going to have. And can take us back now, we're thinking Neolithic period, and back at maybe about 15,000 years, but no farther. And why is that? Because there's a very simple model of, of word replacement. And if you go and replace a certain percentage of the words every century, like 1%, 2%, and you take it back to 15,000 years, you have a handful of, of cognates, maybe two dozen, and you can no longer distinguish between chance similarity and actual cognates. So it sort of runs out of steam at that stage. But right now we're pushing it back that far, this is new. And we're going to perhaps get that back to the Neolithic and then we'll stall and maybe the geneticists will have some more, something more to say. But right now the archeologists, the geneticists and the linguists are all sort of falling together and coming up with very similar scenarios for various parts of the world. And I assume that this will continue on and become more inclusive uh, as time goes by. So thank you for your patience and I hope that uh, made sense. Uh, it's strange. I mean, it's nice if I could write it on a board or something like that, um, but there are some good books on Indo-European and um, there's a, a, like a whole dictionary <laughs> Or you can go through about 800 words that they've come up with, which is not bad. It's a good, good choice, good sampling. So they, uh, they spread, they, they absorbed all kinds of peoples, genetically and linguistically. So it's cool. John, do we have a little bit of time to ask sure. you some questions? Sure. So yeah. Before that, can oh, we all goodness, I talk, I talk for a long time. <clears throat> So I know you guys uh, were, were born to prepare questions. Uh, who would like to ask one first? Okay. Oh wow. Okay, I'm gonna have to be that guy. Let's do. Uh, let's do it. I'm just gonna go a strip like this. Indo-European expansion. I, so, yeah. I have. Well, I, was, I more of like a like a silly question. Kind of. Okay. I was just gonna ask what, in his opinion, what was his favorite language, but. It, favorite like, language, John? Lie, so. I can't hear the question. Uh, favorite language? Oh. <laughs> or which one do you find most fascinating? Did you hear that part? What 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 no. language do you find most fascinating? Circassian. It's the most complex language I've ever seen, um, and the one that like I was I learned uh, has um, about 70, 70 consonants in it, and. Um, the verb, the verb looks like a centipede. It can have four or five pieces on front and another three or four pieces on the back and consists of a single consonant buried in all that. And somehow they hear that. Um, it's very weird. And it, it does a mirror image of what almost all, all other languages, including English, does. Um, so if you take a course in phonetics, they make a big deal and say, look, a vowel in front of a voice consonant uh, the jug, uh, a vowel in front of those is about 30% longer than a vowel in front of voiceless consonants, p -t -ch -k. so you can have uh, pet versus ped or um, um, bet versus bed, and you can hear it's a little longer, right? And um, so the, the vowels are uh, being affected by the consonant. That's what Circassian does. And the reason it's the mirror image is because you go to another phonetic process. Say you have an E and you have a K 
and you want to say the word key, uh, that key uh, is acoustically different from a ka in the word, say, car, C-A-R. Okay. And so apart from the process of lengthening a vowel, almost everything else that goes on in English is the um, vowel affecting, uh, affecting the consonant. Okay. Uh, so uh, what Circassian does is that's what the English does with the long vowels and all that. Uh, it uses the consonants to, to color the vowels. And the only um, feature, they call it only dimension of the sound that cannot go to a consonant that's not part of a vowel is the open quality of the vocal tract. And so you end up with a vowel that is an uh and a vowel that is an a. Uh. That's it. <laughs> Those are the only two vowels a language has. Um, so it's, it's really quite, it's really quite remarkable. Um, and the other two in the family, Ubuch and uh, Abkhaz, uh, also uh, do the same sort of thing. Um, and they have very, very subtle sound contrast. So the word um, uh, for, um, let's see, brother or horse is uh, And the word for um, to decorate uh, is sh. <laughs> so sh versus sh and sh versus sh. And um, th there's maybe one other language on earth, a dialect of Korean that, that does that. Um, but, um, and there was one down on the Gulf Coast that's extinct uh, that used to do it, supposedly, from descriptions we have. So it's very, very odd, very, very, very strange. And um, to hear them babble, that I was at a conference and there were just every dialect was, they were just babbling away. It was extraordinary. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to mention something you had figured out and explained to, to me before. We had, we do these meetings called program advisory committee meetings where we bring in like deans and experts to come talk about our programs with us. And we think about them, right? And so I'm always on those. And so we had the, the head of acting for OSHA. You guys know OSHA? Yeah. Came up and he was part of that, part of that meeting. And he brought it, he said this random thing. He said, he said, why is it that all these Australians and uh, Brits are getting all so many more roles than, than Americans disproportionately. And he goes, it must be because of X, Y, Z, P, Q. And I put it to John and he goes, they all have to learn American normative accents. And that Americans don't do the work to learn a normative American accent. You sound like you're from Illinois. You sound like you're from Dakota. You sound like you're from Florida and it's, sabotaging you compared to Brits who have wildly different accents, but have to learn how to speak like they're from, what'd you say, John, like, uh, like New Jersey, where, where's the, where's the normal accent? Uh, in North America or England? In North America. North America, the only place where they speak normative English is, believe it or not, Toronto. Um, and some of the suburbs around there, it, it begins to peter out in the city of Hamilton at the west end of Lake Ontario. <clears throat> where my university is. Uh, and even there, you get some, some uh, local dialect effects that are I also found in places like Martha's Vineyard and stuff. But Toronto. Uh, I thought you guys would get something out of that for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, Riley. You said that the changing of languages is inevitable. Do you think the death of language or the extinction of languages is inevitable too? Could you hear that, John? No. Uh, do you do you believe that uh, I might invite you guys to come up and ask? Like, yeah, come come ask John. <laughs> hey John. Hi. Uh, my no. question was um, <laughs> my question was you said that the changing of languages is inevitable. Do you think the death and extinct extinction of languages is inevitable too? Well, it means that the community has uh, to to lose a language. Languages basically have to be murdered by competing languages that uh, offer uh, some kind of stylish advantage or aesthetics or economics or whatever. It doesn't always have to be money. Um, and the mass media, uh, of course, blanket out minority languages. So um, back oh, about 20 years ago, there was some kind of referendum in Canada that across the entire country and they made up a kind of ballot in all the languages spoken because it's officially bilingual English and French. But there are about something like about 19 languages on the ballot. 
uh, 17 of which I, <laughs> I was not aware of. Um, and I actually, I'm, I'm about half an hour away from the Iroquois uh, nation uh, down the road. Uh, and in fact, the hereditary chief uh, lives a few houses away from me uh, <laughs> in my neighborhood. Um, and uh, so they're trying to revive and maintain that language. And there was a meeting, kind of a party to uh, celebrate the establishment of a program uh, in Iroquois culture. And there were some old Iroquois ladies there. And it's a matriarchy. The ladies had the last call. And um, they got up and I, I, was, I was going to the bathroom. They were going to the bathroom and they were talking about going to pee in English. I thought, if you're... <laughs> If you're the, the last speakers and you can't talk about going to the bathroom in your native language, the language is shot. It's dead. Okay. Mm. Um, so it is a social loss. It's not just a matter of, of a kind of these languages are naturally occurring algorithms, really. Uh, it's not just a loss of a particular algorithm or, you know, vocabulary. Um, and they're not all the same. I mean, they, they, I, I ended up studying 18 languages and each one in the world is different. Um, and uh, it's, it's a loss of world, it's a loss of community. Um, and we have yet to find some kind of social strategy where a smaller, uh, less dominant uh, community can maintain uh, its, its integrity um, without giving in and basically assimilating in some way. So. John, I, I think the way things are going, we'll have more varieties of ketchup by the time the century is over than we will languages. Um, I was just going to mention, John, that uh, that conversation we'd had uh, around the um, Circassians trying to make sure they could keep their language alive. And yeah. you had mentioned uh, a couple key things. If you want your language to be alive, then um, what was it? One, it has to be... Uh, what, what were the key things that you had to do that once this happens, it's gone. Once it's, once it's not uh, used for. Well, it, it has to be used uh, for family dynamics for one. Families. Uh, yeah. And it's for intimate, intimate exchanges. Um, it has to be used for entertainment value for music uh, or for uh, epics and, and stories. It has to be used for uh, novels as well. Um, and uh, it has to be used uh, to some extent in public ceremony or public events. Um, and uh, right now the Circassians in the Middle East, it's, it's the Russians did to the Circassians in the 18, uh, 1864, uh, what they were trying to do to the Ukrainians, but they succeeded and they drove out about 90% of the population which now down in Turkey and Jordan. Um, so it's a kind of a code, kind of a secret code. Um, and I thought that it was pretty well moribund, but at this conference back in 19 in Nuremberg, uh, I heard all kinds of dialects. So this is clear that for some people it's still very much the medium of exchange, providing they feel that there's nobody around who can overhear them. <laughs> you know? So it's sort of a secret code uh, but it's still very much alive as a secret code. I was surprised. <clears throat> Next question. <laughs> but it's we'll, it's mm -hmm. yeah, please. We'll, we'll get up there, no problem. But yeah, let's, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, so, <laughs> so I grew up in Russia and the Czech Republic, and uh, Russian languages and the, the surrounding languages are fascinating to me. And something that I've noticed is that Farsi is extremely similar to Russian. And I was wondering, just the sound, a lot of the words are very similar. And often when I'm uh, working as a server, serving people speaking Farsi, I think they're speaking Russian at first. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you noticed um, the similarities between those languages? And did you have any information as to yeah, yeah, so it's, 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 it's Yeah, so do you speak Russian? Uh, not well, no. <laughs> no uh, okay. Um, <laughs> there's a bonny Farsi so about me, Tony. Um, oh. Oh. No, okay. Um, <laughs> I can count to 10. Yes. <laughs> uh, I didn't hear that. Just you can <laughs> count to 10. Oh, count to 10. Oh, yeah. 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 Y
Uh, in Russian, not Farsi. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Um, the Russian is a branch called Eastern Slavic, and it's thought that the homeland was pretty much where Poland is now, and that the uh, people that were going to become Belarusians and Russians and whatnot uh, began to migrate eastward. Um, and the people that they encountered on their southern flank were nomads that spoke uh, a language like Farsi, like Persian. Um, now, it's, those languages were probably much closer to Pashto from Afghanistan or Ossetic, Ossetian from the North Caucasus uh, than, to, than to Persian. It was quite a divide, but still what the Slavic languages, particularly Eastern Slavic, what they show are a lot of loan words uh, from ancient Iranian of some sort that have been brought on board, brought on board into, uh, into Eastern Slavic. Um, the other part you might have been picking up was simply Indo-European uh, uh, cognate matches, uh, cognate set. Um, the dominant feature for most people that don't speak Russian is the palatalization. Um, and there, uh, there's a claim for some of the extinct Iranian languages that they may have had some palatalization, but uh, Farsi and Persian does not. So I would think that the overall tone of Farsi as opposed to Russian would be, would be different, but you must be at the level where you're actually picking out words um, that are, are cognate words. And if you look at the grammar uh, of Farsi, it's actually very close to English. Uh, <laughs> more, uh, Russian has all this elaborate case system. Uh, you get that in Ossetian, you get that in a bit in Pashto, but in Persian, no. Uh, like English, it's sort of flattened that all out. And um, the verb, present tense of the verb is, is a present continuous, just like English and things like that. Um, uh, so it's, uh, it's close, it's close to, um, closer to more of a European sounding language than something farther east. If you go into Hindi, uh, into India, you start getting these retroflex consonants, kur and gur things like that, that have been picked up from native words that are pre-Indo-European and part of the population that blended in. Uh, so they sound very different. They have a very peculiar, uh, distinctive quality. Um, and uh, um, they have lots of st what we call stops, PTK, Pataka, Pataka, Badiga, Badiga, things like that. Um, and Iranian doesn't have that. Iranian is more like English, it's you know, Pamba and Tanda and that kind of thing. Um, so why? Well, one thing, this is a feature that's somewhat problematic, is that languages that are related can diverge, but then often show changes in each place that are similar, even though they're not obviously in contact anymore. And uh, so it gives the illusion that they're closer together than they are. And then you, you wonder, oh, okay, how, how come? Well, they have common innovations. Why? We don't know quite why. And one, one answer is, well, they're coming from a common source, so they have common innovations. I, I don't know. Probably the answer lies more in theoretical phonetics and, and perception of speech sound, but um, uh, which is quite a, a, a messy and challenging field in itself, phonology, um, that kind of thing. So, I mean, English has retroflex T's. And you probably had never noticed that you're making them. So uh, there's regular t, and then there's the t and tree. And there's regular uh, stew, uh, unaspirated, and the uh, t in uh, street. Um, and so actually, there are five forms of t. You only hear one. Okay. And that's phonology. It's a kind of psychology of sound. Um, and so, um, but what they do in India is they hear all of them. <laughs> they make them all this thing. Um, so they had a different different psychology of listening to what was going on. Uh, mm. But Persian didn't have that. The language in, in Persian front plateau um, was, uh, before that was closer to Dravidian in some way, was Elamite. Um, and so Ur, Ur, uh, Ur of the Chaldees, it's an ancient uh, uh, Bronze Age civilization in the Middle East. And Uruk, Uruk was where 
the ancient hero Gilgamesh came from. Ur is, is Dravidian for a settlement or, or town. And Uruk is, uh, Uk on the end is near a settlement or town or near Ur. Uh, so those are Dravidian names. Uh, here they are always in the West, all the way away from India, South India, where the Dravidian is not spoken, except for one language in Pakistan. Uh, they're all from the West in the Middle East. The one in Pakistan is, is Brahui, um, which is an outlier of Dravidian. That's another family. Um, and uh, so the geneticists have yet to lay, lay hands on that and try to work that one out. <laughs> but they're working right now on Indo-European. Um, because it's the first, it's the most advanced of all the studies. More work has been done on Indo-European than anything else. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to ask John. It's just a good way into linguistics because of exactly that. Um, who has another question? Yeah, please. And then we'll um, is there like a lifespan for languages? Like, is there like an average lifespan? Did you catch, is there a lifespan for languages? Yeah, uh, in terms of the turnover and all that, uh, one number is 500 years. Uh, by the time 500 years have gone by, people speaking whatever it was at the beginning will not be able to understand people at the beginning. Uh, already with Shakespeare, you have trouble. And um, you really need footnotes to understand a lot of what Shakespeare is saying. So I'll kill him who lets me. And let there uh, is not allow. It means to delay. It's related to the word for late. Okay. Um, so, you know, that's a famous line that, that's always misinterpreted by, by people without footnotes, <laughs> um, that kind of thing. Oh, another one from Shakespeare, again, I would, from Hamlet, I would ear the earth. Ear is from an old root, A-R, which was to plow, okay? And the T-H on the end of, of A-R, earth. Um, you get an aardvark, an uh, earth worker um, in Dutch. Um, but you get um, uh, the TH in, in month for moon and uh, truth, uh, which is a TH stuck on the root for tree, which originally had a W on it. <laughs> okay, trio. Um, so this is a, an old way of deriving abstract terms or, or terms from more basic uh, words. And uh, I would ear the earth means I would plow the earth. Another one for a footnote, for sure. Uh, so about 500 years, he's pushing the, the, the boundary. Question, do you think that movies could slow down the change of language or not? Well, if you go back to the old ones, it might, it might slow it down. But my general impression, I'm 77 years old. My general impression is that language is chugging along and changing movies or no movies. Uh, and so the newer movies, they simply manifest the newer language. Uh, for example, between you and I is very, very common now. It's ungrammatical. In fact, in terms of linguistic theory, it's very difficult to even explain what's going on with that phrase. The, the between part, the preposition governs both pronouns. So it's between you and me. And that you can give a coherent theoretical explanation for. And the other one, you have to do something and, and pry the, the case off of me and make it into an I and whatnot, but that's caught on. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. question. Kimberly. Uh, yes. Um, are there any uh, languages that exist today that have been so isolated that they are preserved in like, their ancient forms? Uh, and what was the last few words there? You said? Uh, so that, isolated. Uh, that... I can come up. Yeah. Um, uh, are there any languages that still exist today that have been completely isolated that they are preserved in like the the ways that they were spoken in ancient times? Like the Galapagos Islands of languages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A genetic, uh, genetic a deep, a deep freeze. Um, some change less less rapidly than others. Um, so English is one of the fastest changing languages we know of. So if you go back a thousand years and look at old English, it, it looks like something totally unrelated to what we're talking about now. Um, on the other hand, Finnish uh, still has words in it that were clearly borrowed from Germanic 2000 years ago and have not been changed. So one of the, the, the games for people who work on reconstructing Germanic 
is to take their reconstructive form, their proto form it's called, and compare it to something in Finnish. Um, so the word for king is kuningas in, in the reconstructive form of Germanic. And it means someone who rules the kinship group, not the country or so, but just the kinship group. Ken, kuning, kun is the kinship group. And you go to Finnish and it's kuningas. Um, they had loringas for a ring and you go to, to Finnish and it's ringas. Uh, so <laughs> Finnish hasn't changed much in 2000 years, but um, uh, there are some isolated populations um, and um, uh, they, we assume that those languages are devoid of outside influence, but because they're isolated, we can't get there to find out. <laughs> so it's mm -hmm. hard, to, hard to answer. Really cool question. Yeah. Yeah, if you like. <clears throat> Hi. Um, yeah. We Hi. are talking about how uh, language, our society affects language, but how about how language affects society? Because I know certain languages um, inhibit certain thoughts about like certain objects or like mm -hmm. ideas and stuff like that. Yeah, they have so, different worlds, yeah. yeah can you talk moral about imperatives that? and interpretation right. of action and, and obligations and whatnot. One example I can give um, is feminism, uh, business of pronouns and whatnot. So, you know, there was a recent uh, a young woman died in custody recently in Iran and having riots now and whatnot. And so women are, are, are strictly suppressed by the conservative regime in Iran. Farsi has no gender. That language has no gender at all. And another example is, is Japanese, where uh, the women were, you know, subservient, very subservient traditionally, not anymore, but traditionally. Again, no gender in Japanese at all. Um, and you go to Circassian, uh, no gender, and yet the, the women had enormous prestige, uh, enormous influence. Uh, same thing with Mohawk, uh, no gender, and yet it's a, technically one of the few known matriarchies that we have. And I've been to meetings where nothing flies unless the elder woman, eldest woman at the table says so, that kind of thing. So the inter interplay between the world or society and language is called the Sapir Horth hypothesis after two linguists from the 1920s, 1930s. And um, uh, it comes in a strong form and a weak form. And it's a matter of intense debate. It seems to be a complicated issue. Uh, it's, not, it's not simple. There do seem to be uh, different cognitive states that are dictated by language. Um, and, but other, others seem to be almost independent of it. It's weird. Mm. Another question? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Connor, really cool question. Yeah. Um, so how does like how did the first initial languages start? Like was it just you look at water and mm. you call it whatever the fuck whatever you want? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, language, language evolution. We don't know. Uh, I have I had a form of uh, a theory about language evolution that was based on logic not on genetics and not on um, anything explicitly linguistic. Uh, I couldn't get it published. Why? Because Chomsky said language has no evolution or whatever. Um, um, chances are it, it's a spinoff from something like an animal call system. And we still have something like an animal call system in terms of intonation and cries and things like that. Um, but it seems to have, um, it seems to be replicated by the way children acquire language. Um, and the important thing to know about child language, they start with simple sounds and then they end up with more elaborate sounds. And so there's a sound hierarchy. And then in terms of words, there's a word hierarchy uh, and it's dictated by meaning and not by grammar. Okay. And then they start with more complicated things, start having very basic grammar that where an entity splits in half, it's called bifurcation. And then it, it splits again, that's trifurcation. And that gets, starts giving you something resembling actual sentences. So the evolution of language would have been nonlinear. It would have been characterized by enormous jumps in output and productivity that were reflected by very minor changes in the actual grammar that was, that was going on. Um, it was thought at one time that it has something to do with the use of the hand and making weapons because the language production area, um, usually on the left side, 
uh, is in the front. It's right next to where the hand control area is. Okay. And the language perception area is further back and uh, behind, behind or above the ear on the temporal side, whereas the uh, language production is Broca's area, B-R-O-C-A apostrophe S. Okay. Um, and it turns out it's, we're not entirely sure. Sure, that's how you, you use Broca's area to talk, but it turns out that language is somewhere else because there have been a number of cases of people with severe Alzheimer's. Uh, I've seen a movie of one uh, where they can't talk and they can't understand what's being said and whatnot, and yet they can sing and they understand what they're singing. And so somehow the music faculty has access to the language, which is stored somewhere that is distinct from where language production or perception is actually implemented. It's sort of complicated. I've got so a question. There's a woman named Fedorenko at MIT who's studying polyglots and where you know, brain scans and where the language might be and whatnot and getting very odd results. So polyglots that speak 30 languages and all their, their, their speech area is hardly active at all. It's very strange. I have a question about that. Uh, and first of all, any of you guys remember mirror neurons, right? Yeah. Mirror neurons, those are also in the Broca's area. So, but how many of you out of curiosity would be willing to admit that you've had some dyslexia in your life? Yeah, not, un not uncommon for artists, right? Not uncommon for artists. Um, I, I had dyslexia. And one of the things that means is that my Broca's area in my left hemisphere of my brain wasn't particularly successful with language. So what happened is my language started migrating to the right hemisphere of my brain. This is one of the things that happens with people who compensate for dyslexia. But I suspect that many of you who raised your hands have neurodivergent, uh, are neurodivergent, and that you have probably, if you have dyslexia and are creative, you might have started shifting language to other parts of your brain than other people use. You might be able to say things other people aren't quite sure how to find words for. I'm curious, John, what do you think of, of people or of these compensated dyslexics or neurodivergence with the use of language? It seems possible. I mean, one question is, what, what, when you answer your phone, which ear do you put it to? Yeah. Okay. And in most I'm cases, you put it to your right ear, touch. which means that your speech areas are on the left side because there's a reversal. Uh, and that's normal. It's like 95% of the population. I always go to my left ear, which means my speech area is on the right side. And it's not clear why. Um, but the, the, the brain is able to reorder, reorganize itself and transfer functions from a canonical area uh, to new areas. Um, and there's not been a lot of study of that. Um, so that would be neuro, neuro linguistics in some way. Um, <clears throat> I helped establish a program at McMaster at my university, McMaster University. Um, and um, the, uh, we had a neurolinguist. We actually hired a fellow who was a neurolinguist. And he said one thing that I thought was remarkable. He said, I scanned the brain of, of a bilingual woman who spoke English and Chinese and I made her count from one to 10. And her brain looked entirely different in the two languages. And I thought, well, let's go from there and see where else it go. But nothing, nothing happened after that. Um, we worked on other stuff. Um, and what happens with a lot of this kind of thing, unless you're institutionalized and in the care of an MD who's willing to uh, subject you to a range of, of tests and all that, it's very hard to find time uh, with brain scans and whatnot to, to do interesting exploratory work on people that are otherwise healthy uh, or, or coming out of something. Um, uh, one, one other thing to see is that um, uh, I was just reading uh, uh, some, some politics about Gabby Giffords, who was uh, shot in the head a few years back. Um, and uh, the, the fellow right, uh, reading actually knows her quite well and says she has trouble using the right side of her body. So what's happened is that the, the bullet has damaged Broca's area, so she can't talk. She's trying to learn to talk. And it seems that if you have damaged uh, material, it gives off interfering discharges that prevent uh, some kind of reasonable recuperation or reassignment of function. Um, and it's when the, the area is completely destroyed and gone that there's no interference 
that the deep, deep seated, deeply stored speech area uh, or speech material can be reassigned to some other area. Um, th this is this goes back uh, some uh, seventy some odd years, way back to the forties and fifties. There was a surgeon in Montreal called Wilder Penfield, and he pioneered uh, brain surgery on people using uh, an anesthetic that allowed them not to feel pain but to be awake. And um, he he found that he had people with severe epilepsy. He would have to remove a speech area where there was always damage in the brain. If he cleaned it right out, within five months they were talking again, even though that speech area was totally gone. But if the speech area was damaged and left in, they did not recover. And I, I don't know, I mean, I'm not an MD, so I don't know if that guidance from that study way, way back when uh, is still influencing research or not. Well, it's uh, foundational to, to neuroscience to know that we all think that there's a location where such and such happens, and it is kind of like that. But every time they go to try to take that location out of a mouse, and think that this is the spot where it does this, it will reconfigure and rework. Yeah, so it, it, it led to this idea yeah. that, yeah. that what the mind is doing is not to be deconstructed into like hyper-materialistic, localized, it's, it's something else. Something more profound is happening. Yeah. Um, I just have a question. We're talking about children and how uh, much easier it is, you know, pick up a language when you're younger and then by a certain age, that barrier kind of comes in, it's harder to pick up that language without an accent. Why is that that a certain age that kind of stops? I don't, I didn't hear it. Why, why, it what's up? Yeah, what's you want, you want yeah. Learning um, a language, you mean? We were talking about how languages are easy to pick up, um, oh, like as children. Hit, when you hit puberty, you lose the ability to pick up languages. Okay. Uh, you also you also lose your thymus gland, uh, which you have as a child, which is down in here and has something to do with the immune system. Um, we, we don't know. Uh, it seems that there's no limit on the number of languages a child can acquire. Uh, but once you hit puberty, it's a different ball game. They're going to speak with accent. They're going to um, um, have a, a heck of a time picking up another language. Uh, the people who are hyper polyglots, uh, one theory is that they have neotenous brains that for whatever reason, they haven't gone through the kinds of transformations that afflict people at puberty. And they've escaped that, but they, um, uh, so they retain its ability to pick up languages. Um, the, the business of, of um, why this would be, why they their brain would not they, they, see i know one guy over 50 languages right socially completely awkward uh, often there's a price to be paid for these ca capacities they are often socially uh uh inept and act as though they're sort of childish uh so there is a kind of neotenous like profile uh to the people involved um what we'd like to know is what the child is doing and where the heck the kid is putting all this stuff uh, and stashing it away. Um, you know, it's, it's weird. I, wanted, I was going to return just to the question about language evolution to make a point as well. Um, the argument I had had to do with the number of, of sound contrasts and how efficient it was to process information coming in uh, to the brain. Uh, but it turns out that if you go to uh, Homo erectus, uh, uh, Neanderthals, um, maybe um, Denisovans or whatever, uh, unless you have an upright posture, a face that's pushed in, mm -hmm. and a mouth that is a kind of arched ovoid, you cannot make the acoustics that most languages have. You end up having maybe two or three vowels, uh, maybe four or five consonants, and you're going to have very, very long words. Okay. So there's an efficiency factor. And the modern posture, the modern face, I mean, the nose is stranded. The nose is where the face used to be. It's pulled back. Why is it? So we still have noses because it helps to moisten the air. Otherwise, we'd be dry all the time. So it's stranded and the chin is stranded. And the face has been pushed in and the posture has become erect. And this is a, an acoustic adaptation to be able to make lots of sounds. Mm. 
Okay. You have all these so I forgot to, to mention that. Yeah. But John, we're, we're, uh, we're now down to our last five minutes. And and um, I thought I'd ask and see if, if you want to share anything with us. Because the other thing, John, I, I mentioned to all of you, uh, has a background in, in politics and, um, and intelligence, as you can tell. Uh, and so I'm wondering uh, if you want to say anything to us about the relationship between language and politics or language and uh, the political landscape today even, whichever, whichever sounds better. Hope you guys will listen good. Don't pack up. We won't be able to hear anything at the very end, but then we'll go in five minutes um, and we'll all say thanks to John at the end. But the last question, John, if you don't mind. Well, let's, let's talk about um, uh, instilling certain attitudes in, in your audience. Um, I think that there are rhetorical devices that are almost innate in, in the, are a part of the social glue uh, that comes with being a modern human. And uh, Trump, for whatever reason, I mean, I look at Trump and I see a shyster. Because, but, uh, I mean, I, I took my kids down to Atlantic City to show them you know, places in New Jersey. And we landed right on the exact day and hour when the banks were seizing the buildings that Trump, <laughs> Trump had invested in. And you know, for you to, to, to have a casino in New Jersey and not make a fortune, you got to be one screw up. A major, a major clown. And so I see, I see Trump as a clown, right? But apparently he gives off certain signals that allow people to feel that, that they belong to a group in some way, that, they, that he's sort of their, their leader and has their, their um, interests at heart. Um, and to my mind, it's difficult to imagine why people buy into it uh, because I have this other, other I, I know things about Trump basically. Um, so uh, it's queer, but there are rhetorical flourishes. Um, I had to give a talk in Turkey one time um, to a room full of Circassians uh, about the 2014 Olympics, uh, which were staged in Sochi, which is uh, was the Ubik city, Hüce, 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 and Ubik and Chet is a seaside, so not seaside, um, in Sochi. And I found myself unconsciously giving this ringing ovation that captured everyone's attention. So there are intonation patterns, there are phonetic patterns um, that seem to trigger social responses. And a good politician knows those. Biden doesn't know, so, know those. Biden is, I mean, he's been very successful in certain measures, but in terms of getting up and, and rhetorically, you can see sometimes he sort of gets there, but he doesn't quite have it. Um, I'm trying to think of someone who does, who does have it. You're saying something, it's almost like a hypnosis of language. Yeah. It's like a use of words, a use of language and sounds to give people feelings. Well, there's a cadence that's crucial. I, I was involved with a local mayoral race a couple of years back. Um, and the guy, I kept trying to tell the guy, look, we need a half hour and I'll uh, coach you on how to talk. And what you do is you identify a phrase and you complete the phrase and you pause. And then you do the phrase slightly differently and you pause. And so you can repeat things like that, but you have to, to deliver a phrase, not a sentence, but just a piece of a sentence. Pause a moment, deliver it again, pause a moment. Deliver. He get up and he just, blah, 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 blah. he knew a tremendous amount. He knew everything about the, the city and the finances and what was wrong and so forth. He was impressive, but he lost the election. He only got about 30% of the vote. <laughs> I never got a chance to, to pull him aside and say, okay, here, let me coach you on how to get a, get, get a political speech and how to capture the audience. So um, there are techniques. Um, I, have, so, I have myself been involved somewhat in politics during the Clinton years, but I've never th particularly thought uh, too much about uh, uh, Trump's uh, effects and how he manages to... to make a certain portion of the population feel uh, feel they belong in some way. Yeah. Um, That's really incredible. And actually, for many of you in here are actors or all of you are involved with delivering lines on one side of the camera or the other, right? And you start to realize, well, the study of, of words, the study of how to use words, how to use words to great effect, you can extend that study beyond just drama. There's a lot for you in linguistics and language about how to actually use language to have effect. And actually, I, I would suspect that uh, 
So looking at how to give a political speech might teach you guys some extra powers that you might not have considered otherwise too. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's 2.30. I want us to all thank John and then thank I'll you see John. you guys next day. <laughs> okay, bye guys. Thank you guys. You need to check in with your groups on the way out the door. Make sure you do. I'm looking forward to your presentations or projects on Thursday. Thanks y'all. Well, I really appreciate you for having all these cool speakers. Oh, and, uh, yeah, I thanks. Mean, I love your class already, but like, the speakers are cool too. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for asking the question. Absolutely. Hey, John, I might let you go and uh, yeah. answer some questions I'll have here. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Okay. Well, so we'll skip tomorrow, no? Or do you want to yeah. meet tomorrow yes uh, i i ha i want to i have questions that i didn't want to answer because i want to let them ask questions but uh yeah you want to skip tomorrow well we can we can let's see let's schedule for it and if i have to uh, say no um but so far i mean so far so good okay, okay so cool. let's schedule for it okay, okay sounds uh, good and, um, and i've got that essay ready we can check it out and uh oh, yeah. want to know what you think about the fact that biden laid COVID to rest on the same day the queen was laid to rest. Yeah, there's that, I know. Um, yeah, well, but that's, fact, for, uh, that's for you and me conversation. That's another. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Well, okay, all right. All right, all right. Bye. 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 In the UN meeting today. Are okay, thank you. Um, let's check that out right now.